Our speaker is uh, Kevin Van Austin Bridge. Kevin is the uh, uh, he's a county commissioner in the third district. Uh, he is also the uh, uh, the chair of Seaport Manatee. A lot of people don't realize that uh, the port uh, is a part of Manatee County, and it's the one part that doesn't collect any taxes. It lives on its own and makes money. Uh, ports a great deal for Manatee County, and the. Uh, uh, your county commissioners uh, run that. Uh, they just put on a different hat and uh, move over uh, to the Port Authority. So, uh, Kevin's been here before, and uh, I've got a bunch of stuff that you've done and what you're doing, but you can always say it better than I can. So, Kevin. is right next to our school and I know everybody yeah. at that park so they you're you're smart at what you do you wouldn't tell them not to do it but at GT Bray and the other parks every employee or many of the employees said you cannot be here and drove my volunteers away I'll take care of it that's we're not allowed to do that I, I know because I tried to, to stop it because the other side was getting trying to get signatures to put abortion on the ballot um, <coughs> so I'm sure Mr. Massacre will write about that now um, but it is what it is. Um, so I'm um, born and raised here. My name is Kevin Van Austin Bridge. I represent District 3. District 3 is the coastal district. So basically from downtown west, think of it that way. The islands, all the beaches, uh, that's all encompassing of District 3. It runs north up into Palmettos like Sneed Island, Teresia, even Rabonia are located in District 3. I'm born and raised actually in District 3. It gets really <coughs> localized for me. Um, I was elected in 2020, and I was, I really first got involved in politics, started paying attention to politics, uh, because Ron Paul, I was a little bit younger, but Ron Paul got my ear, and I was a big Ron Paul supporter and Ron Paul fan, uh, he was the first candidate I ever gave any money to, um, I wasn't much, I Do you have the didn't receipts? have much. Because we'd love to see the receipts <laughs> that you donated to Ron Paul. I think Q&A is at the end. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, so you know, he was the first candidate that I, or you know, really politician that I started paying attention to, and then eventually uh, Donald Trump runs. I, I become a huge Trump fan uh, supporter, and uh, I end up ultimately deciding to run for office, basically inspired by President Trump. Um, I, I never really thought about running for office before that. Uh, I'm kind of direct in how I talk, and I'm kind of old, I guess you could say. I, I'm not really apologetic uh, when I talk, and um, that, I thought, you know, you, you can never run for office, you get rid of that. I watched Trump, and he, he didn't care, he just said it the way it was, and I was like, well, maybe there is room for me in politics, maybe I could get away with it. Um, so, I ran, and I, I haven't made excuses, I haven't... Uh, you know, I haven't backed down from liberals. I, I kind of in their face at times. Uh, wins me some fans. It loses me a lot of fans as well. Um, Commissioner Satcher, early on in, in my term, he made a motion to ban abortion in Manatee County. I didn't know if that was going to fly, but I am unapologetic about being pro-life, and I seconded the motion. And I voted for it. We started to move it forward. We took a lot of heat for that. There were protests in front of the building. People came dressed up in, in, in outfits 
uh, that been set in the chamber as like silent protests and this sort of thing. Uh, they spotted us in the halls at, uh, uh, in Tallahassee at the Capitol one time. It's the same group of people. Uh, gave us, you know, their opinion, putting it lightly. Um, but, but hey, that, that's the job I ran for, and, and these are the things I believe in, so, so that's what I did. Um, Commissioner Bearden brought forward making Manatee County a Second Amendment Sanctuary County. And what did that mean? Ultimately, it meant that if and when, let's be honest, if and when, the federal government were to move on, further move on our Second Amendment rights, that the county commission would be obligated by its own ordinance to defend it and to go to court and to battle them and to fight for rights for the people in this county. Same thing, you know, not quite as bad as the abortion issue, but people came dressed up in shirts and you know, the same colored shirts and hollered at us and told us, you know, we have blood in our hands and all this sort of thing for giving people the right to defend themselves. And I probably made some bold statements and pissed people off then too, but uh, it's just, it's, it's what I believed in, right? And that's kind of how I've been. We moved to give employees the right to, to conceal carry at work, manage county employees. I didn't really have an issue with it. I did talk to the sheriff just to make sure he at least knew what was going on over here with us asked him what he thought. He asked me, how many public works and utilities guys, like blue collar guys, do you have walking around town on a daily basis? And I was like, about 500. And uh, he says, these are good guys? And I said, well, we wouldn't hire them. They get background checks. And he says, I, I like that. I said, okay. So, so we moved forward with it. Um, there were a couple of exceptions legally we had to leave out. There is a law that says you can't, if you're concealed carrying, you cannot intentionally insert yourself into conflict. Right? Well, Let's be honest, code enforcement does that like five times a day. Um, you know, there's, there's several folks that, that do. So paramedics, code enforcement, there's a few exceptions that we had to leave out, unfortunately. Um, but I felt it was the right thing to do. We were giving our, our employees an opportunity to protect themselves. You know, the last thing I wanted was a story about one of our employees cowering in a corner, hiding when someone came in trying to impose harm in our building. So that's not going to happen. At least they have the option, put it that way. They have the option for that to not happen. And of course, people came in and screamed and yelled at us and said, there's blood in our hands. And the liberal media wrote nasty things about us. And that's that's part, of, part of the job. COVID. So when I first got elected, we still had all these COVID policies that were being implemented. And we came in and we didn't want those policies. I don't know how else to put it. We didn't agree with those policies. And we disbanded all of them. There, we took the, the little temperature device that was at the, when you walked in and there was all this, well actually the meetings were being held at the convention center when we first got in. And we moved the meetings from the convention center back to the, um, back to the chamber. There were these little temperature devices and whatnot. And it wasn't like you just took your temperature and it just told you what your temperature was. When you took your temperature, the thing shouted to the whole library <laughs> what the temperature was. Um, and of course, we had an R building and parks, and they were all over the place. So we had all those removed and taken out of there. All this glass was put up in front of everybody, um, you know, keeping everybody away from one another. So we, we got rid of all that stuff. And I had blood on my hands. I had a lot of blood on my hands, I guess. I had blood on my hands then, too. And um, then I actually got COVID. And of course, they all said I deserved it. I had some pretty harsh emails that saying that I deserved it. Um, anyway. So, so I've been kind of bold in that way too, and, and I know that ruffles some feathers. I get involved in other politicians' campaigns. Again, I don't apologize for these things. I've helped some other folks. Um, Steve Vernon said to me when oh, Steve Vernon said to me when he was the chair of the REC, um, Ballard called and said, the Commissioner Ballard, she's running against felony, and she calls and she says, Hey, I'm running against Reggie. She says, I. I want you to support my campaigns. I said, well, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know if it's a great idea for me to jump into campaigns with other, you know, taking out other board members. You know, was, you know, he's a Democrat, though. You know, but on a personal level, I like him better than some of the other board members. But uh, I said, let me think about it. Vernon calls. We don't agree on everything, but he calls and tells me, you're the chair. Part of your job is to grow the Republican majority, period. And I was like, you know, you're right. And he was. So, jumped on board with taking out Bellamy, helping Ballard. Uh, and then I got a little fire in my belly and uh, jumped on board with helping take out Serbia, jumped on board with helping take out Whitmore, 
And next thing you know, the two rhinos and the Democrat were out of there, and we had a, a literally seven member strong conservative Republican majority. Thank you, sir. We um, jumped in and I started helping a guy named Richard Tatum, uh, and actually, I was the first person to ask him to run. I met him here, like right here. And uh, we were standing in the back and we started chit chatting. And at one point, I said to him, I said, Do you ever think about running for office? And he said, Well, I've only lived here two years. I said, You live in Labor Ranch. Everybody's lived there for two years. <laughs> um, and but we just got to know each other. These guys saw a true conservative. There was a Democrat representing that district. Uh, after a while, he, he realized that there was a, a need for a strong Republican out there. And, uh, and he, he did. He ran. He did a great job. And I think we've been a pretty solid conservative since. And uh, Cindy Spray jumped in kind of unexpectedly with the run. Glad she did. Um, the people she was running against were one was a Democrat and one was a poser, if you will. But basically, a, I always say a, a, a Democrat in sheep's clothing, right? Um, so I helped with those campaigns. Glad I did. Uh, you know, ruffled some feathers when I did that. If you're catching on, I, I tend to ruffle feathers. Um, so anyway, let's get to enough about me. <laughs> Let's get on to some issues. Top three things I hear about when I go around town. Let's not tiptoe, I don't do that. Let's dive right into the good stuff. Uh, top three things that I hear about. Uh, I do a town hall or go to an HOA, that sort of thing. What do I hear about? I hear about growth, traffic, homelessness. Does that sound about right? More informed crowd here. So I'm sure they want to talk about more issues than just those three, but, but typically that's what I get. Those are the main three. Um, so let's start with growth. When I ran, one of the things that I ran on was, I, you know, I said, I, I know we're growing and I get that, but there were things, because I'm, I'm born and raised, I'm the only native on the board. Um, and even I think back then, I think Reggie was the only native on the board. So I said, there are things that I can handle, right? If a road goes from two lanes to four. I can handle that, okay? But there were things about the way the county was growing that I didn't like. I didn't like that it was changing a lot of the culture about sort of who we were and who we've always been, because I'm one of the few that have always been. Uh, I didn't like that McKechnie Field became LECOM. I know it sounds silly, but it's been McKechnie Field my whole life. I didn't like that MCC Lancers, because the school grew, which, you know, okay, fine, grow the school, educate more kids, fine. But I, why does it, you know, SCF, okay, but why, now we're the manatees, and we're not the Lancers anymore. Really I know these seem like silly things, but Carol, you, you've been here forever. You, no, no offense, but, you know, <laughs> you know like that. Um, I think you get it, right? Like, why are we changing these things about who we are? And, and so one of the reasons I ran was to try and protect things like that. I think the, the Emerson Point purchase, for, for me, was, was one of those things, right? You know, it's right at the entrance to Emerson Point, that land. Like me, like most people, I for the longest time thought that was part of the preserve. I thought it was just a part that they hadn't built trails in yet, you know, or whatever. But no, it's not. It's 90 acres of privately owned, and they were marketing it for development. Um, so that that was why I ran. And there are opportunities like like the Emerson property where we have an opportunity to protect those things and to sort of save those things about who we are and our culture. Uh, but but on the subject of the actual growth itself, I will say. I will certainly admit that, especially that first year, I did not anticipate how much was coming down the pipe and how much was going to land on our desk and how fast it was going to happen. Uh, I also didn't realize how much was approved before I got there, and I didn't understand the timeline. If you're familiar with 75th Street and Cortez Road, right? Oh, yeah. Certainly gorgeous. So, that piece right there is it's the only real development in my district. Um, all of that was approved before I ever got there. It wasn't long before I got there, but it was all, I've, I've had no influence at all, which is really aggravating, over that development. Because see, they had all their approvals before I was on the board. Um, and that just, I bring that up to kind of give you an idea of how, one, it can be frustrating, and two, uh, how the, the sort of the timeline works on a lot of this stuff. Um, so at any rate, we have voted some things down. We have ended up in lawsuits. Um, there was one that the Terra, if you're familiar with the Terra property out of uh, 70 and Terra. It's a piece is bigger than just that. It kind of winds back in there. Um, anyway, that was voted down. They filed a lawsuit against us. 
Uh, some new commissioners came on. They came back to us, tried to get it approved. Let's get out of the lawsuit. We still didn't like it. We still said no. Uh, turned turned down the request. So they continued to sue us. We ended up having to pay millions of dollars. Um, thankfully, we we sort of caught at the end of the deal that we were paying these millions of dollars. They weren't going to give us the land. So we were like, well, hell, if they're going to pay all the money, might as well take the land. Um, so in the end, we paid millions of dollars for this thing for land that we really. I don't necessarily want it, but I wasn't going to pay millions of dollars. I have nothing to show for it. Uh, so if we worked that into the deal, at least give us the land. So we paid millions of dollars for that. Then there was one out on 70 by Panther Ridge by the concession. And we voted no on that. And I think it went down four to three. They threatened all these lawsuits. Sure, whatever. We, we, had, we had really had enough. And so, no. They do sue us. County attorney calls you in one at a time, you know, sunshine, you can't talk to everybody at once. So he calls you in one at a time and he tells you, I don't know how I'm supposed to win this. Um, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, you'll, you know, win it, figure it out, you know? <laughs> I don't know. But he says, well, I don't know how I'm supposed to win this. I'm just letting you know. And I said, hey, go win it, go figure it out. And so I said, well, he can't tell me what an individual colleague said, but he can tell me generally what's the rest of the board think on it. And so I did ask him the next day, I said, how did, how did the rest of your, your talks go? He said, pretty much everybody told me the same thing you did. I said, okay. About six months later, he calls us in, sits you down, and he says, well, we're about 60000 into our costs on legal fees. Might have been more than six months. I've been closer to a year. And he says, on the other side, is about 100000 into legal fees. I said, okay. And he says, and we're at the point where we're, gonna, we're about ready to go to court. He says, and the legal fees are going to they're gonna really start to pile up. <coughs> Okay, and he says, I'm calling in here to tell you that the smart thing for you to do at this point is to cut bait. He says, we're going to rack up huge legal fees. We're going to have to pay their legal fees, plus we'll be out of cost for hours. He says, and he's like, Kevin, they are going to win. I, I don't have a path to victory on this. I'm like, okay. And he says, so you're the boss, you know, whatever you seven want me to do, we'll do. But... I don't have a path on this. What do you want me to do? And so I get in the, you know, well, I'll think about it. And um, apparently some others did too. He circles back eventually and he says, I gotta go to court in like a couple of days. I've worked out a deal with them if you guys will take it, but I gotta go to court in a couple of days. You need to make a decision. And I said, well, you know, how much are we looking at? And, and he's still looking at the $20 million range. And I said, okay, well, you know, maybe cutting me might be the right decision on this one. Um, so we do, but it gets even better. On, on our end, it gets even better. Not only do you have to, have to get to pay their $100,000 of legal fees, which that's like, I don't know exactly what it was, but roughly 9000 Not only that, but then you still have to approve them. So, and you can't just say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. They have to come back to a meeting while you sit there and eat crow to this developer, giving him a hundred grand, plus you have, right, right, it's agonizing. Plus you have to end up approving the thing. Uh, and then and then off they go. Um, then there was Lazy Sea Ranch, which was out by Stacy Jesse. Left Lazy Sea Ranch on Rye Road. Um, what was it? 4,400 units, I believe, was originally 4,400 units and some commercial and whatnot. Oh, and the, the, the two roads didn't line up right for the traffic signal, even better. Uh, so we voted no. I don't remember exactly what the vote was, but it wasn't unanimous, but we voted no. And uh, Similar conversations with the attorney calls you in after maybe two or three months and says, "So they're they're going to sue us." Um, it's like, okay, and he says, "And this is not like the twenty million dollar one." I'm like, okay, and he says, "This is significantly bigger, significantly bigger." I'm like, "What what are we talking about?" He says, "Hundred." Okay, so. Some negotiations. We came back. We got them down 1,100 units, I think. We talked them down 1,100 units. I think we removed the commercial aspect of it. And no, did not remove the commercial aspect. Oh, we did not. That's right, because we thought it was better because people weren't going to have to drive the commercial. We thought we could keep them. Sometimes we do that too. We try to keep them in their little neighborhoods, their big neighborhoods, by giving them their own commercial. They don't have to drive there everything all the time. Keep them off the road. And that was how we we decided on that one. I believe they worked out a deal with their neighbor get the uh, the street lined up with the other road as well. The county has so, a plan. Yeah, so we, there's a plan. I would love that. So there's a plan for that. So, you know, 
when it comes to growth, we, we do do what we can. I will say I did not expect the amount that came at us, especially how fast it came at us. And I did not, I did not expect that my hands would be tied to the extent that they are, uh, which is kind of aggravating, more than kind of aggravating, to be honest. Um, that said, I hear a lot of people say that, you know, put a moratorium on it, end it. Um, this is this is back to the sometimes I ruffle feathers. You, you may not always we may not always agree on everything, um, but I told you I was a Ron Paul fan. I mean, the bottom line is on the as the government the government's job is not to literally stop business. Uh, it is it is not to, to end businesses. And even if we don't necessarily <coughs> agree with them, I mean, you know, a strip club is one thing. This is employing thousands of people. It's not an immoral act. Uh, and in my district, there's a, you know, the houses are getting built in District 1 and Parish and District 5 and Lakewood Ranch. You keep in mind, they're employing an awful lot of people in my district. Uh, I had a former mayor of Bradenton tell me that I should drive essentially from downtown to T.T. Bray on the back roads between Cortez and Manatee, long rectangle. He says, drive the back roads between Cortez and Manatee. And he says, that is your district. Those are your constituents. And if you do that around 5 p.m., which is when he, 6 p.m., which is when he told me to do it, he's right. You go through that Manatee High neighborhood, the Southern Parkway area, all that right crime. Um, and it is one tradesman's vehicle after another. It's a drywall van, an electric van. It's, it's just one after another after another all the way through there. And you have to keep that in mind. Um, it's short a, a moratorium or saying no more, no more building out there is... It, it, could be, you know, it, could like it happened in 2008, right? The free market did that in 2008. And it was it was pretty devastating to a lot of families. And I, I, I want people to be able to work and put food on their table and a roof over their family's head on their own floor. So, uh, and we, if we disagree on, on some of this, that's okay. Um, traffic. I think we solved it, right? <laughs> um, so when we got on the board, you had, we, we came in and there were literally hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in reserves. The previous board had accumulated um, uh, I, I, rainy day fund, I'm not sure, but I think they were scared to act, but they were sitting on huge amounts of money. And you know, even when I was campaigning, I was saying things like, we're sitting in traffic and they're sitting on our money and not doing anything with it. So when we came in, and our first budget, which was in October, so we get elected in November, I don't really get to act until October. So we come around that summer and we laid out roads that we wanted to widen. And we did, and we started tackling roads in a big way. Unfortunately, when I got elected, so did a guy named Joe Biden. And inflation started to hit us around this time. Which really, the more I think about it, the more it aggravates me that the previous boards did so little when it comes to roads. The money would have gone so much further if boards had acted 10 years, five years before, but especially 10 years before, even if they did five years before, when they were approving a lot of this stuff, they weren't allocating anything towards road expansion. They were working on one major road that was at one major road that was 44th Avenue. So I give them credit for that. They had the vision for that. They were working on that. There was nothing else. Upper Manatee River Road, yeah. Lena connecting, Lorraine, Moccasin Wallow. I mean, none of this stuff was moving. None of it. And, and when they did widen 75th Street over in my district, they only widened it like halfway down. It was two thirds of the way down. And then they, they bottlenecked it to two lanes by, by Village Green and Palm Soul Park down there, which didn't make any sense at all. Um, so we put a lot of money into roads. It, we're, we're over $700 million that we're putting into expanding roads. The first one that dirt back, like, like, I'm not going to sure because I haven't done you know, Manatee in a while. But the first one that we'll, we'll see action is Upper Manatee River Road, followed by 75th Street. Um, Lena, when I reference Lena Road, Lena Road currently, if you go off of State Road 64 towards the landfill, it dead ends. And a lot of people don't realize you can go on Lena from State Road 70 as well, and it dead ends. There's a, a, a wetland, and I think it's like 12 acres or 15 acres or something like that, so a wetland in the middle, and that's why they never connected it, because the wetland has to be mitigated and moved to a new location and it costs a whole bunch of money. To be exact, it costs $44 million to, to do the roof. 
And so everyone, they, well, it's not juice, it's not worth the squeeze. Um, but if you've ever been near the interstate in the last, like, 10 years, um, you probably think that at this point the juice is worth the squeeze, right? Like, you might as well go ahead and connect that and get some of that traffic off of the interstate. Um, so Lena is a high priority, right along with Mondas and Wallow. Fort Hamer is on there as well. Uh, the previous board did build the bridge over Fort Hamer. I give them credit for that. However, they built a two-lane bridge on the cheap, so the bridge cannot be expanded to four lanes. Tried to tell them. Somebody tried to tell them. I appreciate that. Um, I live in West Brayton, and at the time I was not at all in politics, so I wasn't paying attention, didn't even know they were doing it. But uh, yeah, they did it. They built a, a two-lane bridge that cannot be expanded to four lanes, which means that now we, I say we because you're running, we have to build a second bridge next to the existing bridge, which requires all the duplicity that you're assuming it requires. Um, and we will. The, the two-lane bridge was over capacity the day it opened. So we're going to build a another bridge right next to it, run that thing all the way, but eventually it will be four lane. You'll have Lakewood Ranch Boulevard four lane to Fort Hamer. Fort Hamer, or sorry, to Upper Manitou River Road. Upper Manitou River Road four lane to the bridge, and then Fort Hamer will be four lane up to 301, and we already have it four lane from 301 to Modest and Wallow, and, and on the way you go. So ultimately that will be four lane all the way. And honestly, the roads, they just they can't happen fast enough. We can't start breaking ground on these things fast enough as far as I'm concerned. Homelessness. And that is number three. So when I first ran for office, there was a, the homelessness issue was more prevalent in West Bradenton than it is now. The sheriff has been helpful, uh, and my message has been that uh, and I'm sorry because I, I eventually, you know, we squeezed the balloon a little bit and it kind of pushed some of that into your districts. Uh, but, but the sheriff was helpful when my, in hearing my message that in, in west of 26th Street, you're in West Bradenton, we don't have any services. Uh, there, are no, there are no homeless services west of 26th Street. So ultimately, there's really not much other than trouble uh, to, to be offered. And so I felt like, you know, where the services are is where uh, those folks need to be is near their services. Mayor didn't care for that because, you know, the services are downtown. Um, so we've been sort of been squeezing a balloon or playing sort of whack-a-mole with the homeless issue. And we had a couple of workshops on it. I think we had two, maybe three workshops on homelessness. And back and forth we go with ideas and they said, well, maybe we need another case manager. So we hired a case manager and then the next meeting, you know, the next time we did it the following year, they said, I think we need another case manager. So another case manager and I think we added a, a homeless deputy uh, we already had one I think we had a second okay um, but in the end this isn't really resolving anything um, so we start seeing now having more serious conversations and previous boards we, we got ridiculed to be honest uh, a lot of liberal folks came in and yelled at us that we don't care about the homeless we weren't doing anything about the homeless that wasn't the case at all we were uh, we were trying to figure out what was the right thing to do for the homeless um, we did not want to become a magnet for homeless. That was a concern as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. And so we didn't want to fall victim to that. Um, eventually, a couple solutions came our way. Uh, if you if you go down 41, there's the Red Lobster on 41. If you, if you turn, you go back behind that Red Lobster, there used to be a sheriff's substation, just recently closed. But there was a sheriff's MSO substation down there, back behind that Red Lobster. And when it closed, we didn't need it anymore. The county administrator goes through there and he, he calls us and he says to me, he says, have you ever been in this place? I said, no. He says, well, well they used it for evidence storage and, you know, whatever local, you know, outposts. And he said, but it used to be the armory back in the day. I'm like, oh, okay. Whatever. And because uh, the county owns all of the, the, the sheriff's facilities that Nancy County you know, uh, buys it, makes it, fills it up, runs it. And uh, he says, well, he says they have the troops upstairs. He says, there's 40 bedrooms in here and 13 bathrooms and a full kitchen. I'm like, you're kidding me. And he says, no. I said, okay. And he said, we got to do something with this. Said, okay, whatever. He and Commissioner Ballard get together. They come back with, we're going to do something and we have this thing and it's free. Let's turn this into emergency shelter 
for families with children. It would be a 90 to 120 day transition is the idea. You, you get them into it, there'd be caseworkers, we're gonna move to that site by the way, where we already have, we'll, we'll, we'll put them there because there's offices downstairs. So the idea is to put them there, help them get a job, get back on their feet. And, and let's be honest, we're, we're not, you know, obviously we want to help people, right, number one. Uh, but it's really the kids that we're, we're trying to help here more than anything. They didn't ask to be put in this situation. Uh, they just ended up in this situation. Um, so everybody liked the idea. I didn't want to get into the homeless business. There's a lot of businesses that the, you know, the government says this shouldn't be in. I didn't want to get into the homeless business. Um, so we reached out to the Salvation Army and said, would you be willing to, if we fix this thing up, I mean, we already own it, it's just sitting there, we're going to either mothball it or, or do something with it. It needs a roof, which we have to put on regardless. So we're going to put a roof on it. Would you be willing to run this if we truck it for you? And the Salvation Army was, oh, you, would, you would let us run that? And we're like, no, you would run it? <laughs> and, and they said, yes. And they said, okay. Uh, so it's sort of a, a match made in heaven. They were thrilled that we were going to let them run it. We were thrilled that they were going to run it. And uh, school district has been helpful as well. I see Tatum and Sprayer here. And uh, they're going to put a school bus stop out front. There's even talk of putting a head start in the building itself. Uh, we took an old playground from Blackstone Park that was taken down. It's going to be put together over there. Uh, and there's going to be a community garden that Commissioner Ballard is a big community garden fan. So she's going to put a community, which is just a box of dirt. It's not that exciting. But, uh, but you know, at least establish some sense of normalcy for these kids um, during the time that they're there. That's the idea. There's no issue with security, at least from the outside. Uh, it was evidence storage. It's like Fort Knox. Uh, it's a big concrete building. So we're putting a roof on it and working on the inside. They only had a commercial kitchen. I mean, there, there really was shockingly little to be done to this place. Uh, it, it's painted some brighter colors than the sheriff had it, um, make it feel a little more homey, you know. Um, so, so we tackled that. Went well. Um, you all have heard of Tunnel of Towers? Yeah. All right. So Tunnel of Towers comes to town. Um, we ended up working on a deal. They're they're kind of tough negotiators. The first deal offered wasn't wasn't a great deal. Um, so it was some back and forth before we, we made it to a good deal. And I ruffled some feathers there as well. Um, and But anyway, in the end, we gave them a six, roughly say, it's the property appraiser's value, so I don't know how accurate the value is. So we did it, it's a six million dollars with the property appraiser value of the land as. So we gave them a six million dollar piece of property and they are going to spend, I believe, 22 million dollars building a facility there that will be permanent housing for homeless veterans from Manatee and Sarasota County. And that, that was the, the real negotiating hang up that we had there, uh, was making it so that they would agree to Manatee and Sarasota County only. Um, originally we just wanted Manatee County, but you know, you, you, you compromise, you do what you gotta do. So it's Manatee and Sarasota County vets that will be housed there, and that's on uh, Cortez Road and 66th Street. So we've tackled homeless families with children. We've tackled homeless veterans. But you still have an awful lot of people around town who are homeless that don't fit those two categories. Um, and when I talked to the sheriff, and, I, and I, I, I put some pressure on the sheriff sometimes about this issue, and he says to me, look, he says, the ACLU, you know, I'm sure we're all fans of the ACLU. Yeah. Um, so the ACLU, they'll come after me if I start arresting people for panhandling and loitering and you know, all these like little petty trespassing crimes. He says they're going to say that I have essentially um, criminalized homelessness. So that's what they're going to say. And he says, I, I, I have to have somewhere to take folks. If I go pick somebody up, he says, I've got to have somewhere to say, you need to go to home. You need to go home. And they don't have a home, I can't just take them to jail. He's like, I, I got to have... They got to have somewhere to take them. He says, it's going to be a problem. Salvation Army's full. Can't always take them. Or, what, the one thing that we all love about the Salvation Army is, the Salvation Army has rules. Um, they do. I mean, they, you, if you ever did the tour there, you would you'd be very thrilled with the Salvation Army. Uh, I, I have no issue with that. I don't, I don't like that we give charities money. However, I don't want to be in the homeless business. The Salvation Army does provide a service to us, so I don't mind paying them for service. Uh, but the Salvation Army, in the morning, they hand you a, a bag lunch, and pat you on the bottom at like eight o'clock in the morning and they close up shop, you're out of here. 
and if you have nowhere to go, they say you got to go get a job. Yeah. You know, and, and they give you a bag lunch and go get a job, and then they don't open back up till like five or five thirty, something like that. Um, and then you come back in, and, they, and you come back in, they give a hot meal, and the you know you laundry, you get caught, you know, it, and uh, lights out at like ten o'clock or whatever, you know, be sober, you know, kind of restrictions like that. Um, and uh, and you know, same thing. Next morning, you know, clean clothes and a bag of lunch, and, and off you go. And uh, they give you, you know, a little while. Eventually, they sit you down after a week or two, and they say, you know, you got the job yet? And you got a bank account? And, you know, they sit down with you and really start going through things. And, uh, that's what we're going to do with, uh, we're going to call it Under One Roof, which is the, the shelter for families and children. But we still have the issue of homelessness in town. And we have to figure something out for this issue. Um, and the way I sort of put it, not sort of, the way I put it is, I, I, don't, I don't have anything against these folks, right? We're, we're a Christian community, okay? We genuinely, anybody in here, I have no doubt, if someone genuinely needed help, you would help them. If someone was genuinely asking for a hand up, we would help them. And so I, I, with, with a clear conscience, I can say if there is a way to genuinely help someone who wants a hand up, I think my community would back me on that. And that's sort of what we did with Tunnel of Towers. That's what we did with the Fresh Start program. However, if it's someone who is able-bodied and working age, and they are passing on an honest day's work, uh, and, and passing on that for petty crimes or they just enjoy living in the mangroves and can't handle it, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, there's some, there's mental health aspects to this. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you have folks who refuse, you know, to, to treat their mental health and, and you have folks who have an addiction and, and petty crime. That's a different story, right? So, so that's a totally different story. Salvation Army is wildly overpopulated. I mean, their, their wait list is ridiculous. There's never a, a spot there. Um, it'll, the, the fact that we're doing Fresh Start Manatee will help them some because they can, they can house five families now. And the area where they house the five families, once they move into the family shelter, they're going to house more women, single women, in that area. And they'll go from 13 to 28 spots for single women. So that, that's a significant help. I think they're about 120 spots for single men. So, so that's a significant help. But ultimately, what are we going to do with these folks who are, who are on the street? Maybe we'll do something with them. So what we're going to do, I think, if the board passes it, we've given the okay to start moving forward to some extent, is up at Port Manatee, we have five acres that abuts the jail property. It's not on jail property. It's next door to jail property. On the other side is uh, Seaport Manatee. So we're going to fence this property off for folks' safety inside there. And we're going to clear that out, and we're going to create a tent city in that location. And it will be emergency, temporary housing. You can stay for like 60, maybe 90 days. There will be laundry. There will be, there will be a deputy. It's next door to the jail. There will be a deputy. Um, and there will be a pickup out front for, what do you call it, day work to come pick them up, tradesmen, maid services, that sort of thing, to come pick these folks up, take them to work. You hit 90 days and that's that's gonna be it. County's not gonna run it. Catholic Charities is going to run it for us. Oh. You don't like the Catholics? No. 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 Educate me. All right, educate me. Okay. Nothing assigned in writing, so educate me. Come next week. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm very open-minded. I'm going to run this similar story. Don't let me walk into a sand trap. All right. I, I can't talk across the table. All right, well, we'll talk about that. I don't want to walk into a sand trap. That's for sure. Um, I'm down from the audience. All right, well, I'm going to keep explaining you know, what, what the thing would be. Um, and so the the current, uh, our daily bread, which is which is Catholic charity. Right? Yeah, right. Okay, I'm yeah. starting to draw the line here because, connect the dots, I should say, because one of the issues that we have downtown is our daily bread. Well-intended folks, but it's no strings attached whatsoever at our daily bread, and they're serving lunch in the middle of the day, which is enabling people to not be, you know, out gaining employment, right? So we, we want, the plan is to move them from downtown to this site and say, dinner only, no lunch. Are you aware of the order 
I, I, I work all day. I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm very open-minded and, and ready to hear. Um, again, don't let me walk into the same trap. Uh, and we have made no agreement with them ultimately at all. There's nothing in writing. Um, so, put it this way: there was an idea to possibly have Catholic Charities run this, but it's very much up in the air at the moment. Um, so we're open for other organizations who are interested in running this. Perhaps the Salvation Army. Um, and, but the idea ultimately is, if we create this site, yes, it's temporary, but we cannot continue to have people standing on the side of the road, knocking on your windows, begging for money. Can't, you can't, you can't do it. No, I don't give them money either. I, I get it. But, but clearly, someone is giving them money because they continue to stay on the side of the road and beg for money. It drives me nuts. And every time I see it on my side of town, I have a, a, a captain with MSO that I call and I tell him, this is what's going on. You know, get out here. And, you know, usually they show up, I, I'm assuming. Uh, I, a lot of times I will circle back and check. Sometimes I park and wait. Um, but, but they typically show up, and I have my usual hotspots, 59th and Manatee Ave, the Applebee's over on 4th Yeah, I have my usual hotspots where I have to call. Um, and of course I call the mayor and I give them a reason for so I give her a really hard time every time I sit, take pictures, you know, send it to say, hey, nice city. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Now it's really the point across that for the 50th time. Um, but, but ultimately, <coughs> we, we have to come up with something because we're, we're looking like San Francisco. And, and we can't, you know, we, well, if, if, I feel that if, 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 I, if I don't do something, the tents are going to show up on the side of the road, right? They're going to show up in parks. And, and they're going to show up in parks. And there's going to be an issue where we're going to get sued, right? And so I'm trying to find a place to put these folks that's essentially a safe location that is outside of town that puts them on the right track. And it's, well, that's, that's a valid point. What she just said is a valid point about a bus ticket because that is actually part of the program. Um, the idea is that we would be focusing on people who have been here five or ten years. If you have any relatives, if you're from Michigan, if you have any relatives out of town that aren't around here, the idea is gives you a haircut and a shower and some clean clothes and prop you up in front of the Zoom, right? And reach out to those relatives wherever they are and tell them, look how great they're doing and blah, 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 and all this sort of thing. And, and as soon as you can get a head nod from them, buy them a bus ticket and, and off they go. And that's not to be cruel by any means, but your family should be taking care of you. Your, your family should be looking out for you. It's not some, it's basically the transient population, which we've been struggling with, like, severely struggling with of our homeless but and the sheriff will tell us when there's waves it happens in waves and, and this is the time of year that excuse me that it tends to happen we'll get these waves of transients that come in and, and we got to deal with them but i got kind of got to have somewhere to take them to clean them clean folks up to get them sober and to get them back home if you will ma'am if uh, I'm, uh, i think a better idea if you're going to spend money on ten city, a ten city, which I think is a terrible idea. Right. And you want I don't to love help, it. And you want to help people? Can you find a, a, a abandoned place where you could make it a uh, treatment center, a ninety day in? Yeah. So she's asking, could we do a treatment center instead? A lot of it's mental health. Yeah. We could. Yes. I mean, I guess where I'm going, where my mind has been on it, is I didn't want to make anything too permanent. Does that make sense? Well, because ten city will just be revolving homeless people all the time. So it's like, I mean, if I thought if I was homeless and I knew I got a dinner at Salvation Army or a lunch at the Ten City, I mean, sure. that wouldn't make me get a job either. I mean, they're still giving, they're still giving them a place to stay in food. Sure. So you're still enabling them. Yeah, the idea is to literally not enable them. And so, but I, but I see what you're saying. I mean, they, um, they have a tent. They have good I know we're going to do Q&A at the end, but, yeah. but I just, you know, I can see you yeah. saying things that make sense. Um, but yeah, the idea is actually to do the opposite of enable them. And that's why I didn't want to do something that was a permanent, I really pushed back against the permanent structure, because that's what happens with government, right? As soon as you build the thing, it's just endless. And it, and it never, the Gold Coast constantly shifts the food and it never stops. But so it's a tent city, right? Is it? I mean, it, it, well, yeah, I feel like a tent city is so easy to sort of sunset off. Uh, well, then just don't do it. Well, we haven't done it. So 
that's, 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 have, that's the good news. We haven't done it. I mean, we the have, idea has been tossed around. We have uh, homeless people in Paris now. We don't even have buses out there, so. I know. You know um, I don't think we're Oh, sorry. No, we're, we're out of the normal protocol. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Then we'll have the Q&A where we can get very specific and give you some time to think about, because I know you have some good ideas. Think about them, write them down. I have a lot more. How much time do I have to write a lot more time? Ten? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. More than that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's how it happens. Also, it's, it's like that. Yeah. So I'm good looking at you. More than that. Um, so real quick, uh, I did not. Vote, kind of like Carol Feld said, I, I did not vote for the for the, the millage for purchasing of uh, environmental lands because I uh, simply don't didn't agree with raising. I don't. I don't like. I never raise taxes, so I didn't vote for. I was a. I was not a county commissioner at the time. I was a citizen. Um, but anyway. But but it passed, and so and that's and as it's constantly pointed out to me, uh, it passed by a higher percentage than my getting elected did. So obviously it's more popular than I am. So uh, so be it. Um, but we have made two since, since the money is there. We have made two significant purchases that we finally gotten through. One was called Crooked River Ranch, which is um, it is just west of the Fort Hanger Bridge on the Manatee River on the north shoreline of the river. It's, 70 acres along the river, a uh, beautiful piece of property, upland like oak hammocks, there's some pines and palmettos, and then of course there's all the wetlands down there by the river. And then today, one from my district, which I'm super happy about, uh, is Emerson Point. So Emerson Point, it looks huge, but it, it turns out 90 of those acres are not part of Emerson Point, like not part of the preserve. And so we voted today to purchase those 90 acres um, and uh, there was a, it, was, it, would, it could come down to a, a negotiating battle in the end between the county and, and Carlos Peru, uh, and the county ended up winning, and so we, we got the property, and uh, it will not, well, it, it won't be developed, although the family wanted four houses on the, river, on the bay down there, so we, we did have to have the caveat of four personal homes on the bay we're negotiating, keeping them in the corner, you know, so they don't impact the property very much at all. Uh, but that property is safe from development, so we're, we're very happy about that. Libraries. Um, we've had a couple of workshops on these libraries. Um, it was brought to our attention originally by Brinkley. Where did she was here? Somewhere. There she is. So she came in, talked to me, and I think you talked to Satcher and, and maybe Bearden as well, and um, showed me some displays. I, I don't go to the library. Uh, but she showed me some displays in the library, and um, there was one, I'm trying to remember it correctly, but, but there, was, there was literally side-by-side -side displays. One had Obama, hope and change, you know, and all that books displayed there. And then next to it was all these, like, like not, I wouldn't even say critical books of Trump. And there was the Kathy Griffin severed head picture, and it was like, it was so ridiculous. And then the Obama one was hope and change, and he's like, Standing you know, with the spotlight on it, and, you know, uh, and it was it was incredibly egregious. So Alfred Kinsey was in it. Who? Alfred Kinsey. Alfred Kinsey oh, was in it. Oh God! You gotta be kidding me. Oh. All right, there you go. So anyway, it was, it was like really egregious, and, and I was like, we had no idea. So once she told us that, now commissioners are like sporadically showing up at libraries all over the place, trying to find out what's going on. Um, and then there was a wall. Um, when you walk into the Palmetto Library, I think it was Palmetto, right? I didn't go see that. Satcher went and saw it. So there was this wall when you walk into the Palmetto Library, and the whole wall uh, was, um, it was like trans and LGBTQ and all this sort of thing. And so, all right, we've got to have a meeting. So, so we have a meeting, and Ballard really took the bull by the horns. Commissioner Ballard really took the bull by the horns. And she comes in, and she has this, I mean, she, she <laughs> She had, the, we had 55 biographies in Manatee County Libraries on Karl Marx, okay? <clears throat> and then, you know who Ayn Rand is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Karl guy, so it's hit home with me. Guess how many, we, 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 had, we had biographies on Ayn Rand, but guess how many? Two. Two, yes, you watched watch the meeting. Uh, yeah, we had two on Ayn Rand and 55 on Karl Marx. 55. Um, it, it was incredibly disproportionate. 
Uh, it, it was absolutely ridiculous. And so the, the board, you know, made some attempts to give direction to staff, and, and Washington was our, our administrator at the time, and, and to try to, actually I think Hopes was the administrator at that time, to try to reel things in. And it got quiet for a little bit, then Hopes left, and, well, yeah, but, um, and uh, so Hopes left, and, uh, and Washington came in uh, to steer the ship for a while, and during his, when he was in charge, it, it's sort of like, um, Staff thought, well, you know, hopes is gone. We can sort of get back to the way it was. Well, the substitute teacher is here, uh, and so it flared up. This issue flared up in our face again. So we had another workshop. Uh, we decided to expand the library board because this, this, you know, the board blames staff. Staff blames the library board. Uh, so we decided to expand the board and put some additional folks on there, as opposed to removing people that were were on the board. Um, so we did. So we expand the board from five to nine, I believe, and put some additional people on the board. Then we opened the Lakewood Ranch Library, which I voted against. Again, I ruffled feathers. Uh, it was a 50,000 square foot building. Uh, I think libraries are very quickly becoming antiquated. I'm sorry if you don't agree with me, but I think they are becoming antiquated. Uh, and we're building the Lakewood Ranch, and if you were, they said, we gotta get kids reading, and no offense to the people who live in the demographics of Lakewood Ranch don't, really scream we're going to get kids reading um, and I thought you know you have I think we have nine schools that are like title one and, and you know kids reading below grade level that's what I'm looking for we have nine schools where kids read below grade level and Ballard Elementary is the only one that has a, uh, a library in its district and I thought yeah we're really trying to get kids reading you build libraries where the kids don't read well uh, but no one seems interested in that I want to build smaller ones instead of bigger ones they could more you know, yeah. IT base, uh, but that, I didn't, it, it went over and my dad says it went over like a pardon church, so, <laughs> not well. Um, so six to one, we built this Labor Ranch Library. It was open about two weeks, and um, we got a complaint about when you walk into the children's section, not the teen section, okay? I, I could have groaned and dealt with the teen section, you know, and just said I'm old and out of touch or whatever. Uh, it, it, Probably not, I probably would have pissed about that too. But anyway, but, but it wasn't even the teen section. It wasn't even the teen. It was in the children's section where when you walk into the children's section at the end cap, there was a display of books called the Gay BCs. And where you learn how to come out to your parents and tell them that you're gay. These are illustrated books. I mean we're in like the kids section, okay? Um, so okay, so we weren't happy about that. So who got fired for that? Right? That's that's a good question. You know, well, you know the answer? The answer is it was done so soon that the damn cameras weren't even hooked up yet in the library. So when we went back to review it, it was already up. And of course, no one wants to, right, no one wants to acknowledge that they're the ones put it up. Um, so at any rate, uh, you know, it's explained to staff that you know, the board doesn't agree with this sort of ideology of, of you know, indoctrinating children like this, small children section. And we're sort of back to where we started. Um, then, as you know, Mr. Massifer will pick on you a little bit today. You certainly pick on me plenty. Um, uh, Mr. Massifer, I believe, wrote an article about when the board. Am I wrong? If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Did you write an article about my my library board meeting where I didn't want to appoint? I can subscribe. You can subscribe. To I can subscribe to <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I think he wrote an article. Uh, I, there were a couple of them. But when the library board, right after that happened, the library board came up for appointments. And I just felt that the library board um, that, that exists uh, was not in line with the direction that our board was clearly giving from the dais. And they're there to advise. I get it. But, and everyone said they have no power. Actually, the library board does have some power. They, they have a, several of them. One, they, they vote on, we don't vote on what books to buy, they do. Uh, and also, they have to do something with, with like the hours of the library. Apparently, they control some aspects of the hours of the library. Um, so they, they do have some power. And, and I was looking at the list of applicants, and uh, so I got myself into trouble. I said I wasn't happy with the list of applicants. Uh, why not? Why not? Well, they're, they're, they're trying to set me up for some kind of lawsuit because they want me to say something like, well, they're Democrats. But of course, that wasn't the problem at all. 
Uh, I just didn't, you know, look at these folks and looked into them a little bit, and I, you know, I thought they weren't a good fit. I would never say something like they were Democrats. Um, but I just didn't agree, with, didn't, didn't think they were going to be a good fit for us, and so I said I don't want to appoint today uh, because I, I'm not satisfied with this list. And then we had to back and forth about what my dissatisfaction was. I'll keep it to myself. Um, but in the end, they said, well, if we don't vote now, they said that because there's two seats that are currently occupied, we're voting on as well. So if we don't vote now, then the board, the library board, won't be able to meet. They won't have enough people for a quorum, and they can't, the board can't meet. And I, I was reminded of a, a Mark Twain quote. Uh, I like Mark Twain. And he said, a do nothing Congress sounds good to me. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I said at the beginning, I was like, I'm good with them not meeting. Every time they meet, I, I, don't, I don't care for it. So, <laughs> Don't let it be for a while. So we're, we're sort of reevaluating a lot of the criteria because each seat on the library board has really specific criteria for that seat um, that, that the applicant has to meet. Um, so staff, my understanding is they're, they're sort of reevaluating the criteria and it should be a little more open uh, than it currently is. I mean, our planning commission, for instance, um, is, is anyone who lives in Manatee County. And then it's left up to the Board of County Commissioners to sort of, you know, I don't like the word diversify, but, you know, make sure not everybody isn't from one district from Lakewood Ranch or, you know, what have you, and, and, and try to, you know, split it up a little bit. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping that the staff come back with something a little more open and give the board a little more leeway in who we want to appoint to that board. I mean, I don't think I really, I have the media on here, but I, I don't know, you're probably running short on time. Anyway, I, I don't know if I really need to get into the media, do I? I mean, I think you all understand what we're dealing with on, a, on an everyday basis. Um, it's, it's constant, you know, every article is spun, every article is slanted. Uh, they make us out like we're, we're complete lunatics or, or bigots or whatever it is, and, and we're not. Um, the, I might be a lunatic. But, uh, but I'm sort of not clear. Um, but a lot of it, to be blunt, and I'm going to ruffle feathers, uh, but a lot of it, to be perfectly blunt, is media and, and a lot of sort of moderates, I guess, or liberals in this town, they've been used to elected officials who will sort of they'll capitulate in the end. And that's been, that was happening for a long time. People would capitulate. They were they were either not strong enough or, or courageous enough or bold enough or whatever to take on take them on on a lot of these issues. Um, and we have been unapologetic. We've not been afraid to say we're a Second Amendment sanctuary county. We've not been we weren't scared to, to change all the COVID protocols. We weren't scared to take on abortion and and, and we and we knew we were going to lose. Let's, at least I did. I knew we were going to lose in the end, but. Charge the hills. It was an issue I had no problem charging the hills and dying on the charge for. Um, we, we just haven't been scared of them. We've kind of been in their face about it. And as a result, there's been a lot of backlash for it. Courage it. is attractive. Um, I mean, sometimes, I guess. I, I don't know if I've heard you all that well, but um, public safety. We haven't hit public safety, and that's a big one. The county handles EMS. We run, we run EMS, and then we also fund sheriff's office so EMS is, is all of your ambulances right um, we have added new rigs new, new ambulances every year that I've been on the board um, that includes obviously have to add medics an ambulance by the way when you add an ambulance it's 24 7 so it, it requires some employees I, I didn't really think about that at first and then he says we're adding an ambulance and he says okay great I need nine staff I'm like per He's like, it's on the road 24-7. I need two guys on it all the time. I'm like, holy moly. Um, so that, that was a, a little sticker shock. Also, the price of an ambulance is a sticker shock. Um, we added a couple of new stations because fire hasn't always kept up for number one. Number two, GT Bray site is by far our busiest ambulance, and we kept running a second one over there constantly, shuffling around. So we finally just put in our own EMS station there. We now have three ambulances running out of that site, uh, which has helped uh, tremendously. Um, the new rigs, oh, helicopter. We are, we are very close with Tampa General Hospital. We are very close to a deal to have TGH put a helicopter permanently stationed in Manatee County. 
Um, yeah, that's I, I, that's really important. Um, just for response times, and you know, all, for all the reasons that it's important to have one. Sometimes we have multiple helicopters needed for bad accidents, but but we'll have at least one, you know, in the county. Um, we did also do pay increases. We were losing medics like crazy, and we have we had union negotiations. I've never been part of a union negotiation. Um, what we ran into is the the folks who have been there like five or ten years or more. They're, they're the ones who are members of the union and they're the ones who control the union. I learned a lot about this, right? So they, they control, I've never a union person, so they, they're the ones that really control the union. And they, I mean, their offers at first were for people who, if you're a senior a senior medic, right? Or a charge medic, I'm sorry, it's called a charge medic. They had, they were requesting those guys to start at $68,000 a year. And then an EMT, which is the new young kids, they wanted them to start out at fourteen fifty an hour. Oh, really? yeah. Who would ever come work for us? Like, are you kidding me? Um, and so back and forth we went, and the union like wouldn't budge, and we're like, why would they not budge? And then finally someone sat us down, and they're like, because the union is entirely charged paramedics. Like, ah. And then they tried to send dirty emails, and we didn't like first responders and all this. I'm like, I, I do. You apparently have a problem with something. Um, so we, we did finally work out a deal with them, and for our entry level guys. Our, our total package, essentially, even the union agreed, was the second best package in the state behind PASCO. So we were, we were very happy with that, and, and that should help us with recruiting tremendously. We want good people. Um, and lastly, I, I'm very, I don't want to say I'm a serious theorist, but I, I, I tend to be skeptical of so. stuff. Um, AI is one of those things that I tend to be skeptical of. Uh, we've been presented two packages. Uh, for, for public safety AI packages. One is for traffic signals. So you put, you basically you link the ambulance to the traffic signals, and depending on the priority of the call, it's a cat in a tree, this doesn't you know, qualify, but if it's a priority call, um, life or death call, then the, the system syncs the traffic signals to green for the rig as it's going down the road so that the, the rig is hitting free flowing traffic all the way to the hospital and we're starting it near Manitou Memorial because we're going to start it as a pilot and see how it works in that location. Uh, and the idea is to improve, obviously, improve times and deal life or death situations. Uh, so we're going to see all the pilot program goes. I'm actually fairly hopeful with that one. Then there's MSO. So. MSO is kind of an important thing that we do. Um, so MSO is Manatee County Sheriff's Office. And the main challenge that we have faced with sheriff's deputies is there's a certain, oh, I'm going to turn the audience here. So Democrats um, tend to sort of demonize law enforcement, for lack of a better word. Um, but they, they certainly make it virtually hostile to be law enforcement. It's really difficult to convince young kids today to go into law enforcement. What they're being told in schools and what they're what they're seeing on social media, they they don't. A lot of kids don't. They get the wrong impression of law enforcement. I'm trying to be nice here, um, and that has made it extremely difficult for us to recruit new officers. It's the same problem in other counties. Other counties are are jacking pay to try. That's how you solve things, right? People work for money. Um, so they're, they're jacking up pay to try to recruit. When I came in, we were paying in the low 50s wow. for law enforcement. Um, I'm short on time. Okay, so we're, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. So we're, we're paying in the low 50s for law enforcement. Uh, we're currently paying 66 to start a new deputy now. And in my conversation with the sheriff just yesterday, the plan is in October to start starting deputies at $75,000 a year. Sarasota is currently starting at 74. So if we're going to continue to keep, if either, either we train deputies for Sarasota or we start paying our deputies. Um, we don't want to have issues like they have in other parts of the country. Uh, we want to have the best police officers available, right? We want them to be able to afford to live here because uh, we have the best battle as well, affordability. Um, so it's, it's an investment that we have made and, and cognizantly made because we think it's important, bottom line. Um, also, we've got a new aviation site for our fleet facility, um, and we're, we're seeing more and more, like I said, transients coming into the county. 
we're seeing more and more, you might call them, we're, we're seeing more and more people coming into this county who are, are illegal aliens, right? Bottom lines. You know, people say, you know, you talk about local issues, the border is a local issue. Fentanyl is pouring into this county. Illegals are pouring into this county. And if we don't fund law enforcement properly, like, and continue to fund law enforcement proper, properly, we're going to have the problems of a lot of these major cities. And I, I know we like to be tight with the dollar, especially with the tax dollar, but there are certain areas of your county, that, that, of your community, that you just have to, sometimes you have to throw money at it. And this is one of those things, if you don't want to be San Francisco, you're going to have to throw money at this. Because you have a president that doesn't give a shit and has left the border wide open and is letting people and drugs pour across it. Um, and so we, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Um, so anyway, that's that. And then on taxes, I'll just say that in three years we've lowered them twice. And I think every commissioner at this point is committed to lowering the property tax rate again this year. I know your valuations are going up through the roof. Uh, that's why we're trying to lower your taxes for you. Remember, inflation is killing us as well, so uh, we're having to pay a lot higher bills too. So, all right. Do it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I can just go to the point though, or no? Oh, oh, okay. All right. Now, I gotta get close. Yeah. If you've got to line up, go ahead oh. and line up here, just like we do in the two minutes. All right. Now, remember, I was going to call your first story, but you said yeah. Every, every, I'll, I'll get in line. I don't yeah. care. Every, everybody remembers how we do Q&A. What's the Q stand for? Question. What's the A stand for? Answer. There's no B. What does the B stand for? Okay, so please, if you've got to preface your question, preface it in a couple of sentences. I have a quick question. Okay. If the sheriff doesn't see that there is an illegal problem. How does the commissioners fix it? Um, I mean, we're, that's a good question. Uh, luckily, as, as of today, in Manson County, that's not a problem. So if it becomes a problem, that's a very good question. The, the, the only thing, we control the budget, but even the, the legislature recently passed a law even restricting how much we can control the budget. So now, if he needs money for cars, right, for vehicles, we can give money for vehicles, but we can't tell him Chevy's or Ford, right? So, right, so it, it's, it's, that is even, the legislature's even restricted us a bit lately on that. Uh, so he is an elected official and a constitutional officer. I'm not his boss. Uh, the commissioner simply provides the budget. Um, yeah, I know. But, but luckily, we have, a, we have a good sheriff, so. That's not a problem at all. Okay. Jordan. Okay, I'm going to read a quick quote, and then i got a question to follow it. Uh, this is from a scientific journal called Review of Geophysics. The subtitle is Health and Safety Effects of Airborne Dust in the Americas and Beyond. I'm going to quote a statement. Quote, human exposure to dust is associated with adverse health effects, including <laughs> asthma, allergies, fungal infections, and premature death, end quote. So my question is this. I've heard from you and I've heard from a previous commissioner who was here that the approval process takes so long that you guys had no, no way to reverse all this construction or slow it down or anything like that. That's what I've heard. My question is this. Now that that's already being accomplished uh, for m most of you don't even know me, but I live right next door, right next door to that Lake Flores disaster. The brown and black cloud. Uh, I have asthma. My asthma has been intensified to where I'm having to take a daily prescription. My inhaler I used to use two, maybe three times a week. Now it's that many times a day so that I don't have to feel like I'm breathing through a straw. Anyway, my question is this. What is the county going to do to, I hate to use the word reparations, That's you know, because I don't believe in reparations, but what is the county going to do to make us whole again? Thank you. So just for background on that, um, 
when they started clearing out there, you and I talked, you know, we, we've emailed and, and spoken, uh, but when they started clearing out there, they started clearing literally hundreds of acres, and they did it with one water truck. And the weather at that time was extremely dry. This was uh, the fall, and it was extremely dry. The wind was blowing. There is, there is one community directly next to it, and the wind blew directly at that community. Uh, all things that, because I had some really heated, tough conversations with that builder. Uh, all things that I explained him were, were his problem, not really anybody else's. They became our problem, but they were ultimately, those were, those were his problems to deal with. And he started with one rickety water truck. Um, we went back and forth, back and forth. We eventually red tagged him a total of three different times. He was red tagged. And you know, when I talked, eventually he got the water trucks out there. We were pushing for more than just trucks. So he put all those little mounds of dirt all over the place as well. We wanted sprinklers on those. Um, what I found out, because as I told you, the, that was the first like real significant development in my district since I've been up there. And so what I found out, unfortunately, is we have an ordinance that's really vague and has essentially no seat. So I, other than a red tag, which stops all work, which wasn't really helping the situation because I needed water put on all this stuff, um, I didn't really have any enforcement power or tools. And eventually I had uh, public works and code enforcement say to me, sir, we're not the cops. Like, we can't arrest the guy. So what we're doing is we have an ordinance that staff is working on to bring forward. And the key part of it is going to be, you have had so many working water trucks for every so many acres that you are clearing. Um, that will help with future dust issues. What can you do, your question though, is what can you do to be made whole based on what has already happened? And I, unfortunately my answer to you is I don't know. Uh, I think you could probably have a civil suit that you could, you could file against somebody. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure. I don't mind looking, I have your email obviously. I don't mind looking into it, asking the county attorney's office and getting back. Let me put that in my notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm putting this in my notes. I'm not texting, I promise. Is it weird to was? All right. Some of the Okay. Are you familiar with a 15 minute city? No, um, I know that too. I, I, not, I'm familiar, put it that way. Yeah. I don't know the details. Okay. And I'm only familiar with what I've heard at these meetings. Right. Okay, so do you know that Metro Places is part of a 15 minute city? I don't know if I know what Metro Places is. Metro Places has been obviously approved to be built at Moccasin Wallow in 75. Uh, Metro, metro, I think it's metro places. It's where you work and you live in the same place. Okay. So um, I'm wondering if the board is doing research on these things before they approve them because are your, is Parrish going to be turning in that area a 15 minute city? Because it, it, it looks that way. Do you mind just briefly giving me like a definition of a 15 minute city? It's where you work and you live in the same place. You don't really need a car. And you just stay in your little 15 right. minute zone. Keep in a bubble. Basically, you stay in a bubble. Yep. It's, it's what the World Economic Forum sees for the, the work. Gotcha. That's, their, that's their favorite. <laughs> thing, so I think. I'm asking if. It sounds like I need to learn about 50, more about 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, yes, because the stuff that's going on in Parrish right. is part of that 15 minute city plan. Okay. And living in Parrish, I'm not very happy about that at all. You don't want that, especially you know, anywhere in Manatee County or Florida. I mean, it sounds like generally what you're describing is liberal social engineering. Right? And that's certainly not. And it's, in favor our, of it's that. already being built. Okay. So, so it's not in favor of that. No. Um, Bad. For all the griping, I, mean, I didn't think you could go anywhere in 15 minutes of care. <laughs> well, if you, if you saw all the approved stuff at Marcus, like, well, so you've got, well, you got a hospital that's going to be across the street. Right. You've got the, the Publix and all the food restaurants there. Now you've got the how the, the metro places live and work 
everyone, you can. It will basically right. be like a taking so, note when that's done. I, I don't mean to blow the zone yellow, but, but one of the things that I, what goes along with what you're saying is um, we, we tried really hard. And when I was chair, I, I did what I had to do to try and bring in people who make decisions on money at DC, and we brought in. Um, is that your problem? Yeah, I, I, they took our money. I'm trying to get it back. Um, but we brought in Sam Brace, who is a, he's now the, the chairman of transportation and infrastructure uh, in the House. And we brought him down here from Missouri, brought him down here maybe a year ago uh, when traffic was the worst that I could find to possibly make it. Put him in the sheriff's chopper, flew him over rush hour. Look, we need money. Uh, and in the end, what we got from him was you need to get Republicans back in power because since Biden and the Democrats took over, 70% of the federal transportation money has gone to blue municipalities, not even blue states, but blue municipalities, because they're not spending the money on expanding roads or building bridges or building new roads. All the money goes to mass transit. Right? There you go. Right? That's your and all of it goes to this crap that you're in there. describing. I'm not saying, you know, it's your crap, I'm saying. I don't want that. Crap. I'm trying to say, right? don't prove that crap. crap. So that's, that's literally at the federal level. So I, I, I got, I, I'm a little bit more perceived if I think yeah, about it. Yeah, because they're already, they're, they're They've got one. They've got one in Sarasota too, and I'm. What's it called? It's called Metro Places. Okay. I'm sure they're probably different companies, but that's one of the main companies. Okay, put it in my notes. Or them all. Hi, I'm kind of going here. Back by traffic. I'm okay. Yeah, you gotta like talk right into it. Oh, okay. So I'm new to the area. I moved from Miami. Um, I moved into a development, and I'm not getting a lot of answers about these roundabouts that are going in in these communities. Can you explain to me? Where, where, about that? where are you? I'm in West Brayton. We don't really have much roundabouts. Oh. Yeah, they so it's, um, it's 70 in Creekwood Boulevard, and I just noticed today when I came through that there's all these stakes and stuff up, and it's like right on sure. top of the community. I, I don't understand with a big mall like that, why it's there, and, so and, and why it's going to be. My biggest question is, why would, you, why would a roundabout go in the beginning of a community so that it's almost right on top of the homes and it's an established community that there isn't any other place that that could go. Sure. For me, it, it takes a nice family community and all of a sudden now we're going to have this roundabout. So typically roundabouts are put in for two reasons. One, you don't want traffic to stop entirely. The idea is that it slows and then it goes again or it's traffic calming, which is basically the same reason we're trying to take a racetrack and force people to slow right. down and then go again because there's a neighborhood or right. you know, whatever, pedestrian, that sort of thing. It's like a um, yeah, and then, yeah, and then the last reason which comes up is safety. So where you have a signalized intersection, when you have accidents, a lot of times you have T-bone accidents, right? Where you have 93 hits. When you have a roundabout, you don't have T-bone accidents. One person, yeah, they're going like this, and so they sideswipe each other, right? And it Rye and 64. Yeah. F dot. Sure. And we have people coming from all over. These roundabouts are right here. Because nobody knows what to do. And I'm not going to use that. Oh, listen, I, I grew up here. All these, yeah, these Yankees are down here. That's what drive anyway. Uh, no offense. Uh, but, but yeah, so there's, those are the three reasons that people go to that place to go around from. I've been reminded I'm an elected official, um, the Cedar Hammock Fire Rescue and other commissioner of that group. Um, I have a question. I understand the philosophy of Republicans electing Republicans, etc. And you seem to be very... Um, adamant about supporting people to run. How how do we stop support of people who are truly unqualified to be in that position? I mean, if you have an absolutely horrible candidate, are you still going to back them just because they're a Republican or they wrap themselves in the American flag or they're military? Because this upcoming election has a couple of people in it that are really frightening. 
And just so you know, at our last REC meeting, it appeared, and I'm just telling you what it appeared, the optics, that you coached April Culbreth and got her out of there. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that is the person I am I'm concerned about. Okay, so I would say if, if, you, if you have that situation, then similar to what I did with Richard Tatum, you have to find another candidate. I mean, Golden was running on a post, and we had to find somebody to run for that seat. Um, this will probably get me into trouble and ruffle feathers, um, but Mary Foreman is my school board representative, and she's a registered Republican, and I, I'm, we're always polite and civil to one another, but I, I don't want to see Mary Foreman reelected to that seat, because I, <laughs> she is not filed, but, you know, I don't say turning over every rock, but I, I am trying to find someone in my district who is willing to run for the school board, um, because, you know, obviously Mark is running the parish, and anyway, for all the reasons that it's a good idea to, you know, give them all back when they need on the school board. Um, in regards to the REC, that was, the, I, I, I've heard all the horror stories, right, and that was the first meeting that I've been to in a while, and I got there, I didn't even see how it opened, but I got there, and people were, like, screaming and yelling, and, and it was, like, wild, and so, um, I asked, she, she walked over, April walked over by where I was standing, and I was like, well, what is going on? Uh, and she said, she said, I adjourned the meeting, you know, blah, 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 I was out of control, and so I adjourned the meeting. And I was like, okay. And and so then she was like hanging around, and she walked back up there, so I, I guess you could say I coached her, but I, I walked up to her at the front, and she was like fiddling with the things, and I said, if you adjourn the meeting, you should probably get the hell out of here because these people are gonna like lynch you. And I'm like, I don't mean that literally, but I mean I'm like, like these people are angry and they want you gone. So if you adjourn the meeting, you should leave. Uh, I, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, and she did. She she needed my advice and and you know, as, but I mean since you brought, do you mind since you brought up the R E C? Um, I mean to some extent. I, I, we all have to take ownership of what's happening in the REC. How many of you are members of the REC? Okay. <laughs> so most of us are. So I can't say that to us. Um, I mean, we, to some extent, we all have to take ownership of this. Um, I worked to get Kathy King out. Um, I thought it was the right thing to do. I, I didn't think Kathy, uh, I, I think, put it this way, I thought Kathy was like a Bush Republican. And, I felt like it was, that it was time for the Trump Republicans to come in and take over. Um, it is a nice way of putting it, right? It's a polite way of putting it. Um, and Steve came in, and then you know Steve had a lot of a lot of personal issues that happened right when he came in. And I feel for the guy, um, and so I, I supported his decision when he said he, he didn't want to do it anymore. Um, I did support April when she came in. Um, clearly, it, it doesn't seem like that's working. But I mean, where where do we go? It's like I feel like you know, in the end, it, it has to get resolved. The, the the only ones that are the only people that are winning are the Dems. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? The only ones that are winning are the Dems. The only one that are losing is us. And so I, I don't have a solution in my pocket. I didn't bring one, but blessed be the peacemakers if, if we can get it resolved. Because we, we have to get it resolved. And I don't just say it because I'm on the ballot and I want the strong vote of the party, but this is our last chance to get Donald Trump in. This is it. Uh, and, and, yeah, and if, if we don't, if we don't, shame on us. Um, so we, we, we just have to get our act together. I don't know how. Uh, there's a point where I, I mean, I'll make peace at any point. We have to get it together. We have to get out and organize. We have to start door knocking. We, we have to start mobilizing because the other side will literally buy cheap steel to win an election and we can't even get our house in order. Um, we right. got to do it. We have to do it. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is just a, kind of like a follow-up question to that one. But okay. like, um, since, uh, you know, Ms. Byrne told you to uh, support Republicans. Who? Um, Burn it. Oh, Burn it. 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 Burn
running in District 7. Uh, what can we expect from you? Uh, Who is with the 7 is I? Bruce. Um, Who are you going to come away? You're going to make me ruffle feathers. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, Commissioner Cruz is on the board with me. Um, so we, we always try to get along and be civil to one another. Um, yeah. I try. Uh, I, I'm not, I can't support Commissioner Cruz. Uh, I've not made a commitment on supporting, there's three people, three Republicans running, right? Yeah. For that seat, there's three Republicans. Yeah. Uh, I've not made it, I talked to, to Green and I talked to Colbert, I talked to Cruz, for that matter. Um, but I, I've not made a commitment because someone else could easily jump in that race still. Um, so I'm not gonna support Commissioner Cruz, but I'm gonna wait and see if anybody else jumps in the race before I make a decision. Will you? Jump in that race? You could. Well, technically. Have you considered that? No, technically anybody could. So you won't do that? Oh, so you won't run at large? Okay. Like you said, I don't need one. Well, it's interesting that you said you're not supporting anybody, but then you quoted what April has on the banner of her Facebook, plus that are the peacemakers. Well, that's interesting. Oh. And to Kevin's point, I don't think she made that up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Like, it's I mean, it's okay. My question to you is, time. you the tent city is an abysmal idea. All right. And contracting with um, Catholic Charities says to me that you don't really understand what's happening at, with the UN, with Agenda 2030. Are you aware of any of this stuff? You would okay. be correct. I, I'm Kevin, listen, listen to me. You are not qualified to serve if you don't know about Agenda 2030 and the globalist union. You need to understand how all of that money is coming in. Where's the money for the tent city coming in? The federal government uses money to incentivize states and counties to submit to them. So if any of that money that you're trying to hustle because they took it from us, and then they're going to bring it back in here. They're going to have strings attached to it. So when you take money from the Biden administration, you have to submit the conditions of that money. And part of that is what you're talking about. And we don't want a tent city. We have a massive foreign invasion at the border. Who do you think is hustling those people with maps through the border? Red Cross and Catholic Charities. So we're bringing them here. <laughs> I'll be a peacemaker. Um, I just wanted to say, hopefully on behalf of everyone here, thank you for coming. Um, I know you had a, a really good turnout, uh, and I appreciate you being here and staying as late and taking questions. And you know, I think credit due, Crooked Ranch, um, Emerson Point, getting the numbers down, you know, Lazy River. There have been a lot of things that I still want to cry myself, you know, to sleep over at night. I'm next to one of the big dustbins on Rye Road. A lot is coming, and I get that your hands are tied, but there have been good things that have happened in the past couple of years, and I appreciate that. But I think at the end of the day, what so many of us are concerned about, you know, if we want to talk about big issues, is liberty. And I think everyone in this room probably voted for Trump in 2016, and he came in with we're gonna drain the swamp, we're gonna take back liberty, and average Americans realize that, hey, special interests are what's really gonna take our liberty. But then COVID happened, and this in your face, you know, mass was taking our liberty, and we got distracted by that. But the swamp is local, too. And, and, and so I'm asking this as nicely as possible, but it's hard to look and see without fundraising, suddenly you have $200,000 in your bank account, largely from these developers who are doing really well while I'm you know, like sucking in dust because of what they're doing. At what point am I concerned that my liberty is in jeopardy because these special interests and developers with deep pockets are taking their property rights and their money and then trampling my individual liberty? How, how do we know that So that's a fair question. I knew I would get it. Um, I also knew that I was going to be looking at a general election and a primary election. Um, and, you know, I don't enjoy fundraising. 
but to be honest, we're capitalists. We don't like begging for money. We like earning it. Um, but the truth is that if you're going to win an election, elections, especially if you're going against Democrats who will literally do anything, they will literally steal an election, you're going to have to have money. Um, so back to ruffling feathers, I, I'm not going to get up here and apologize for going out and raising money to win that election. Does the money mean that someone is going to give, you know, be able to give what they want or that there's corruption? No. If you, if you disagree with something I've done, uh, yes. disagree with the decision that I make, is that doesn't make it corrupt. That just makes it a decision that you don't like. Um, but the truth is that I'm running against not one Democrat, but I'm running against two. Democrats will do literally anything to win an election. I have Diana Shoemaker and the general, and I have Tal Sadiq and the primary. Uh. was a Democrat until 2021. Tal Sadiq was told to leave the Young Republican Club last year because of his liberal affiliations and his liberal groups that he was a part of. All right? Literally, a Democrat in sheep's clothing is challenging him in the primary. And is it going to, that's literally the extent that Democrats will go to to beat you. And so I don't make excuses for going out and raising a war chest and making sure that I can win my election. But 
I was told you all were going to yell and scream at us if we went the other way because attendance was way up. But I'm either way. I can care less. Okay, and what about the fact that you can't call into meetings anymore? That was a COVID policy. I did away with it. No, it wasn't. It was. It was instituted as a COVID policy. But we can't call into meetings anymore. Correct. We did away with all the COVID policies. I stand behind that. And, then, and, and why did you stop comments on the so the, the administrator the, the administrator made the decision to eliminate Facebook comments because particularly with animal services, well, if you do what's good for one county Facebook page has to be ultimately good for all. But it started with animal services, with people calling out staff, putting their personal home addresses on there and their phone numbers. And it's then infiltrated into the county page as well. Regal, which was Bill Blake at the time, apparently wrote a memo to the county administrator and told him you are exposing us to a hostile work environment and if anyone actually shows up at somebody's house and does something, you're exposing the county to litigation from your staff. And so at one point we had to either delete it or remove the comment and when we did it because it was of that nature. And when we did that, he got, an, he got an email from the county attorney as well saying that's a violation of sunshine, you can't do that, and so you're exposing yourself to litigation there as well. And so finally he said, I'm just going to take the comments off. And the attorney said, that's exactly what you should do. So he did that, and I believe he sent us all an email or a memo about it in December telling us that he was doing that. So that's the end of that, it was across the board. Okay, so anyway, I guess personally, and I don't know how the crowd feels, I think you should go back to having the developers have meetings so that they can basically lie. They can basically lie. They have to address all the questions and not cherry pick the questions. And then when things get a little tense, just go, okay, well, we're done with this meeting. Okay. And you can't, and you, when you're trying to see it on an iPhone or a laptop, you can't really see like what you can see. I have that in my notes. I will talk to you about that. Yes, ma'am. Sir. Yeah, uh, Commissioner, two questions. The first one's pretty easy. Through various means, I've uh, invited you on April 25th, our next monthly meeting at Popey's 2, uh, to appear side by side with your primary Republican opponent, Tom Sadiq, uh, and then you've got one hand delivered and invite. I haven't heard back yet. Will you be with us on the 25th of April at Popey's 2? Do you remember when I was falsely accused of an ethics violation by a crazy, lunatic, liberal resident of mine, and you went on Facebook and you blasted me and said that I was being guilty? <laughs> Do you recall that? Will you appear? Do, do you recall that? This isn't, I won't be on the diet. No, it, it'll you, be your do, Republican Party point. Do you recall that? Do you remember do you quoting know? the real, this is the genuine conservatives. Let me get to the, the second question since you're obviously going to not answer the first one. Oh, I'm going you're to telling, telling me no. I'm going to answer it. Okay. Do you remember doing that? Yeah, I'm asking the question. Come on, Commissioner. Do, do I'm not running for office. Answer the question. If, if you remember doing that, which I'm sure that you do, do you remember then when I was vindicated apologizing to me? Or coming on in any way, shape, or form and stating that I was vindicated and it was obviously some left-wing lunatic who went after me and weaponized the judicial system to try to come after me? Do you remember acknowledging any of that? Because you went after me hard and you have yet to apologize or acknowledge in any way, shape, or form that I was vindicated by the judicial system. First off, I'll first you want to talk one-on-one? -on -one? I'm, I'm happy to do that. Well, we're right here talking, sir. No, one-on-one, -on -one, I'll talk to you. Well, I'm happy to. Once we bury the hatchet, we step in the opinion. I was never a hatchet. <laughs> okay, so right now you're saying no, you're waiting on an apology for me, who's not uh, who's not running against you. You're agreed. Okay. You're agreed. All right. Well, the second question is this. Uh, you have said from the dais, as had Commissioner Bearden, as had uh, Commissioner uh, Satcher, uh, a couple of things about, first of all, these folks right here, this is genuine conservatives of Manatee County, not the real conservatives of Manatee County, an organization that was put together by the guy who, you put money in the pocket of Manatee Penn TV and not the priest. That's the folks that put that together. Right? And I will apologize for that, because that's true. Uh, do that and you are often accused and, and tonight you're making it sound like you're not going to go in and advocate for any particular candidate in district seven we all know the truth 
We all know, one, that we've got one other Republican candidate that's facing George Cruz that's primarily there just to uh, stir up things like that and doesn't have a chance of winning. We've got a second one that has very little chance of doing it, but that is the one that you favored. And yes, you did vote for her, and that went by accident. Yeah, she didn't invent it, but the point was is that that's where it came from. Just like from the dais, you have quoted the real conservatives of Macon County. A totally farcical website that's doing do that. And, and this group knows that. They know that. But in that diocese, you, you, you said one thing, and this came straight from the real conservative Matthew County. You accused uh, Commissioner Cruz, one, of being anti-Second Amendment, against the right of self-defense, and against uh, being a pro-Planned Parenthood, e.g. pro-abortion. This, my question is, I want to find out how well you listen to your fellow commissioners at the dais, because I'm not so sure that you do. And the question is, what was Commissioner Cruz's argument? Did he say, I would vote no on this totally, under uh, no circumstances for either one of them? Or did he say, hey, if this or that, we could make this a seven to no instead of a six to one vote? What was his argument on each one of those? on the Second Amendment resolution, which, by the way, didn't change anything in Macon County about the Second Amendment. It was words. That's all it was. And you know I'm pro-Second Amendment. You know I am. But the, the pro Planned Parenthood, what was his argument about what he called for so that he could have voted for either one of those? Do you remember what, the, what his argument was? How many hours of county commission meetings I sat for in my years? I, I don't remember his quotes in that meeting. You, you, you made a conclusion and stated repeatedly. There's, there's seven of us sitting up there. We all tend to bloviate from time to time. And you got to understand that. And you understand that. Um, and I don't remember everything that each of us says at all in the meetings. I, I don't remember. I do remember that he was trying to make an argument for amendments essentially to the motion. I don't remember what those amendments were at the time. It could have been a 7 0 vote, and, and it could have brought the commission together. Yeah, if you have accused of the guys by often of being bloviating and campaigning from it, it's pretty damn clear that that, that is the pot calling the kettle black every time. I would like to go back to this lady's uh, question to you, and yes. I would, um, my question is actually a comment, but it's a question as well, and it's basically, now that things are changing at the commission, is there, what would you do, or what can you do, now that we're getting a new county attorney who's coming in, back from the school board, sure. and I believe that the um, administrator that you mentioned um, reports to you guys, doesn't he? So, since you're in a power position as a board, what can you guys do, talk among each other, and ladies, to try to get the comments turned back on, even if it is restricted? Um, you know how, like on social media, they have rules. And if you break the rules, you're out, or you're cut off. Yeah, but but the, the people have to be able to talk to you guys. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. You guys need to figure out how to do it. So my, my question to you is, Will you commit to us as a group tonight to at least go back and look at it now that you've got new players to work with? Yeah, I don't counsel. I, I don't mind going back to look at it. Um, I, I will, though, be sure to say that if if you're under the illusion that when you make a comment on the count, one of the county's like eight Facebook pages on a post, yeah. that you're communicating with me, yeah. you're not. I, I don't read the comments on the Facebook on the county eight face, county eight folk, uh, pages of Facebook. I, each of them is posting like probably multiple times a day. I, I don't read these comments. That you're, you know, said you're the commissioner. You're, you're not communicating. That's not the, the way to communicate with a commissioner at all. Um, email me. You can call me or text me. My my personal phone number is nine four one. Nine six two five two zero two. A lot of you already have it. Just ask one of your friends. Um, you can call or text me anytime. Text is the easiest way. Just say, hey, so and so, call me back. Something to talk about. Um, Say that number again, please. Yeah, 941. I'm a realtor, it's kind of all over the place. 941 962 5202. And the best thing to do is to text me and say, say, hey, this is so and so, and I need to talk to you about X. Um, and then I'll usually say, I'll either call or say, I'll call you in so that, that's, that's the way, honestly, that's the way to do it. 
sorry? She asked if you would make a commitment to chair member for public comment. No, she didn't. She just did. Oh, she, I didn't have, she didn't have the money. I thought you said it, but if there was with the new attorney, when I talked to the new attorney about. Yeah, that's all I'm asking. You have the new yeah. attorney. Can you please do it as a group? Do it as a group. Talk to your new attorney and your administrator. It's just a question again. Yes. Yeah, what can you do to get it turned on with my own rules so you guys aren't getting attacked? So it's really business like. Well, but people need to be able to talk to you guys. The, issue, the, issue, that to them. the main issue, I can tell you, I, I, I'm happy to do that. The main issue is, of course, we can't make any rules. That's 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 the issue. Um, is that you can't make any rules about going after staff. Just challenge your council to be council. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, I'm council. And, and I can absolutely answer that. Yes, ma'am. Sir, you talked about capitulating earlier, but you don't capitulate. It sounds like you're capitulating to attorneys right now. There's no reason why you can't have public comment. That's critical. The first thing. You have to do. So will you fight? for our right for the First Amendment to be able to speak and have redress of our grievances in that way. You absolutely have that. No, it's turned off. Right, it's a liberal Democrat COVID policy that I ended. And I stand by that. You're hiding behind people that. Have, have You're hiding right. behind that as an excuse to turn off public comment under some kind of farcical reason that it's an unhealthy work environment or is nobody's buying that. Yeah. We don't have to agree on everything. I don't. I think you're going to need to uh, capitulate in hearing the voice of the people, which is speaking very loud and clearly right now. And speaking of that, the wetlands buffer, I think it was very clear, wh whatever you agreed with, to listen to the voice of the people. There were conservatives, liberals, Republicans, Democrats. There was one thing that actually started to unite this community, and that was the wetlands buffer. But instead, you capit capitulated to your political consultants. Yes. Who is your political consultant? That's my question. There's a, long, a lot of comments. My question is, who's your political consultant? I use Anthony Pettison. Uh, yeah. yeah. Earlier, you said that Democrats will lie, cheat, and steal. <laughs> Anthony Pettisini has made it a, a career to lie, cheat, and steal against Mike Beltran, Bernie Jacques, every America First candidate that's been out there. like real um, conservatives of Manatee County and other groups, as well as the progressives of a number of years ago, the progressives of Florida, I can't remember the exact name. He's gone, been on every side, and even Jennings DePriest brags about trashing America First candidates. And they're all together, so please, you need to stop capitulating to the political consultants who are receiving all their corrupt dollars from Vern Buchanan, $460,000 to Simwins, by the way, yeah. wow. first to hear that now, yeah. and the developers. My question, is, and my question is, yeah, also talking points. How did you, why in the world would you think to say to kids who have genuine concerns about the wetlands buffer to call them George Sor Soros backed Greta Thunbergs? That's it. So, I was having a conversation with a friend, that. and we were talking about Sun Coast water keepers at that time. The question was, why did I say they were sort of fat? And they had bragged or commented somewhere that they had like $200,000 in the bank, and I was like, oh, there's no way. I mean, they've never even heard of them having a fundraiser. Like, there's no way they have that kind of money. We never did verify whether that $200,000 comment was true, but we did go online and see that Sun Coast water keepers is a chapter of water keepers. Man, you know, the Florida Association of Realtors is a chapter of the association of it. And so they're a chapter of water keepers. So they said, okay, well, they're getting their money from the parent organization and getting handed down. That's why there's never any car washes or whatever, you know, banquets or whatever to raise money for them. So they said, well, where do water keepers get their money? On the water keepers website, they have all of their major sponsors. This is not like some investigative journal, so this was like 10 clicks of amount. Uh, they have all of their major sponsors. I don't know, it's the diamond or the platinum or the gold or whatever sponsor, and it's the Soros Family Foundation. I was like, oh, well, that explains that, doesn't it? Uh, so anyway, that's, that's where I got that from, and yeah, I thought that the, uh, the left was using that kid as a prop, and 
It sounded very Greta Thornburg to me, so I said it. Again, sometimes I rubble that. Is that is I'll try and keep this to more more back on the county side. Sure. And that is allowing for the, the attorneys and you know getting sued and those kind of things to take take those units off or whatever, uh, and allowing for the folks that your predecessors what they approved. And they did bring a lot. Um, how many units, addition, just residential, forget the commercial, have, have, have you added as a group since you were elected? That's a good question. I actually just asked that um, last week. It's a two-part question. Yeah, because what I asked was I wanted to know how many um, total had come on. I don't know the answer, I guess, is my, my answer to you, but I, I'm trying to figure out how many um, total came on how many did I vote against, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, so it would be good to have. When I asked staff, they were kind of, they were kind of like, oh my gosh, uh, that's a lot of work. But I, I do want to know the answer to that. So that's a good question. And, and maybe then the important part, because sometimes I vote against it, and yeah. nothing passes, and, you know, I don't, I'm stuck with it. And I've watched, so. watched how many of you voted for and against it. Sure. Not at it's all more for than against. I, I don't even argue that. Uh, and, and probably the, the part that's more important for me, and I think for the rest of the folks, is and what is going to be the cost for us over the next decade? I'm old, maybe I won't be here. Sure. But or the, the taxpayers, the citizens, or the police, or the fire. You talked about EMS. You know the, the amount of people per vehicle, the roads, the upgrade on the water services, and all that. Uh, what's that? What's that ten-year cost going to be? For the citizens that the developers didn't pay for in their impact fees, and I know you said in your comments that you are relatively new to politics, but back before you got involved, there was a thing called concurrency, yep. and developers used to pay a lot more, and and frankly, a lot of it they used to have to pay before they went and got their approval and got their building permits. So what what I'm trying to sense is. For us as a group, and I'm sure you don't have the number tonight, but what kind of number are we looking at? What kind of numbers, you know, above and beyond that impact fee uh, are we looking at in cost? And I just five, ten years at a suggestion when you and the rest of the folks are voting. That would be a good question to say, staff, what, what's this cost going to be? There are, there are governmental agencies that do that. They'll say, okay, if we're going to do this, this is what we project five more years out. Sure. That's a good question. Two good questions. Pretty highly technical ones, but yeah. Well, I used to be in business before. Thanks for coming out. I was uh, I was surprised you showed up, but I'm glad you did. We're coming to the house. Now you're in my sandbox. Wait, wait, wait. Seriously, were you really surprised that I showed up? Really? Yeah, yeah. 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 We had a lot of no shows before, so it's all right. Uh, my question is, let's go back to the veterans. You said earlier that we, we, we gave the $6 million property to Thomas the Tower. That's not true. You used federal money to pay the Thomas the Tower. So it wasn't taxpayers' money. So all you, all you guys come up and say, Oh, well, we, we gave them $6 million with land. No, you didn't. That was federal money, part of $152 million. So let's, let's just let's clear that up. So it's not taxpayers' money, it's federal money, uh, COVID money, by the way, that yeah. paid for that land, that paid the utilities. Which, by the way, I don't think you've kind of, you signed over the title yet. Although that $6 million, million is already dumped into the utilities bank account, because I did a record request. But you haven't signed a title of it. So they can't even start to pull a permit to start building condos up. Why are you jerking them around? With that? <coughs> if they gave you the money, give them the title. You, they could have rented it back for a dollar a month until the shit was out of there. But you didn't. You're, you're stringing them along, you're delaying that project anymore. That's my first question. My second question. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify the six million. Right. Oh, we gave them six million. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's spend a little money. The million and a half that was taken from the last funds of the federal money earmarked from $15 million went to office design for the project. I, I agree, it's a good project, it's moving forward.
But Amanda Ballard could have got that money from general fund, just like Mike Brown got the four million for his lights, just like Jason Baird got his four million for the memorial park, which was over budget by two million dollars. But anyway, what why did you vote to take that money away from the homeless vets? And how do you how are you gonna correct it? And what funds are available today for a homeless vet to say, hey, I need a hotel room for 30 days? Where's where where are the funds? Why didn't you just leave the money in the silo and, and you could have gave it to turning points and they would have found hotel rooms or you could have gave it to Salvation Army. You left them off the drive. Just so it was bad optics. Sure. So we took we had this COVID money. I thought we had ninety two million in COVID money. One three five, you had seventy eight and you had well, you're right, it was two shots. Okay, so it was the second shot when was American Rescue. Right. So the second shot was, what was American Rescue had was COVID money, right? So with that 92 million batch, um, we were running into, Biden, you know, gives you all this money and then you got to allocate it by a certain date. So Hope says, we got a workshop, we got to sit down, we got to allocate this and tag this money because we don't have it at least allocated for projects, we're going to lose the money. Okay, fine. So we have the workshop and the idea of coming up with something, some kind of a project for homeless vets in Manatee County comes up. Everybody likes the idea. Bob says, we could do the jail. So we talk about the old, the courthouse. Above the courthouse used to be the old jail, it was INS and all this. So we come up with the idea, we'll, we'll do it up there. Okay. We ballpark it the best we can at 15 million. Um, Fine. Once we start digging into that old jail, we realize this is not going to work. Jails aren't made to easily move walls around and redesign them, as it turns out. Half the doors are metal, all the doors are concrete, uh, all the walls, excuse me, are concrete, and it, it's, it's, it's not suitable. You can't remodel the thing. We're going to have to take it down. I mean, there's literally nothing you can do with it. There's no windows. You can't. Anyway, so jail's not going to work. So we're deflated, we're kind of back to square one. We're looking at different options of where we can put this thing. Uh, eventually, Tunnels to Towers comes up. They come to us, and what they wanted from us was property, right? So we talked to them. They were, they were tough negotiators over the, the just manatee and Sarasota so County thing. Uh, but we eventually get to it. We get to it. It's still working. Oh, the light turned off. <coughs> Hit it with your foot. I knew it wasn't something up high. Um, so, um, so, so anyway, so we figure out a way to, and, and literally by partnering with them, public-private partnership, which we always try to do, we could accomplish exactly what we set out to do for six million dollars. And so, great. But the fifteen was an earmark. I know you're like super excited and, and passionate and upset about this. But the truth is the 15 million was an earmark that we, we set it aside for to accomplish X. And we accomplished X with 6 million. And so this is where you and I diverged, is I feel like I did my part as a good fiscal conservative and I achieved the goal with 6 million instead of with 15. You see what I'm saying? And, and there are monies, by the way, that go to turning points and that sort of thing for emergency housing for hotels. Um, it's not specifically dedicated to veterans, it's just for homeless. And we have increased that, by the way. I uh, you know any of that. Um, so those are, those are my answers to the question. So, uh, so, yeah, I get that, but the, the, other, the other issue, <laughs> those are all long-term, right? Kind of the towers is two years, you know, this fast track and I'm 57. I'm talking to media. Vets that are homeless tonight. Yes. Yeah. Where are the funds for that? You could have used part of that nine million. You could have. You could have said we're going to set a million sure. aside. But, but those funds, as you know, there there are funds there for that exact thing. There's 80 homeless vets tonight. That you know that I know. We can right. double that. 200 on the cusp that have no funds. Can't go. Can't go. Can, to I, can, I, can I give you some hard truths? Yeah. Give me some hard truths. All right. So we know we have 80 homeless vets. When Lee Washington was a former Marine, he was our uh, substitute teacher administrator for a while. Um, when Lee was there, they did outreach while we were negotiating with Thomas the Towers. 
they only managed to get, it was less than 50 vets to even make contact with us. And of the ones they made contact with, only 22 were even interested in coming. Um, we don't have, at the moment, vets reaching out saying they need a place to stay, they want a place to stay. Um, if, if, there were, if that was the case, and if, hey, if you go find them and they come knocking on the doors, it's a different story. But as of right now, that's just not happening. I will tell you there is a waiting list of bash vouchers which helps veterans find places. I house two veterans, so I, I know about the veterans. Sure. Um, you can increase the there's a waiting list for the bash vouchers. Right. So why don't you just incorporate your own bash program with the nine million that you that you you pissed away? You could have you could have done that, right? You could have said, well, Vern, until Vern comes through with the extra fifty that you know of, fifty's a lot of people. Especially veterans. Yeah. Be better than if, if you were to say, we have bash vouchers, go find a landlord that will work with you, they would be coming out of the woodwork. Those would be exclusively for veterans who served our country, not, not people from California or drug users. Right. They did nothing. Veterans. Specifically for veterans. The bash voucher idea, I like. And I don't have a problem with that. I'll put it in my notes. Right. I like that idea. We expect 50 bath vouchers by the next meeting, right? By Monday morning. By right. Monday morning. <laughs> All right, let's get on. It only took me four months to get this one. We're going to get a seat of government here. Well, thank you, Manatee Patriots, for having this guy come in. <laughs> things. One, um, I think Mike Ron is doing something with batch vouchers now, but I'll talk to Charlie Bishop, the administrator, tomorrow and find out exactly what it is that he's doing, and then I'll, I'll pitch the idea as well. That's burn, that's federal, that's years in the making. You can do something now. No, he's trying to do something with the city of Bradenton uh, housing authority. Yeah. That's still federal. That's still okay, federal. all right. Anyway, I'll, I'll clear up the vision tomorrow and then I'll tell them what to talk about. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, it's funny you thought I wouldn't show up. But, uh, I mean, let's be honest. This is what makes this country great. I mean, how many places can you get up here and, you know, Kevin and I, you know, go at it toe to toe with the elected official, right? That's what it's all about. Uh, and, you know, I respect the hell out of the guys who literally fought for, for our right to do that. Um, so anyway, I, I appreciate all the grilling. It was good stuff. I appreciate the questions. I actually appreciate a lot of the information I got you know, from the back of the room about 15 minutes of these and things like that that I, I, I just don't know enough about. Um, so I put some good things in my notes that I'll take home with me. And uh, you know, we'll carry, we'll all carry on the good conservative advice. And honestly, kind of back to the REC, like we've, we've got it. I didn't, I didn't intend to put it in front of the REC, but I just, Looking at everybody's faces, nodding like, yes, we all want to have peace, but we've, we've got to figure it out. Yeah, we, we've got to find a way to, for us all to sort of have peace and harmony over there because we all have a common enemy and we, we've got to. We have to win. It's literally our last chance to, to get Donald Trump in. This is our, it's our last chance. And they will do anything, literally anything, to, to defeat, him, uh, defeat us. And by the way, as long as we continue to allow blue dots and red and pink states to count ballots for days and days and days after elections, we will never win. We will never win as long as we allow them to continue to do that. We can't just ignore that like it's a little thing. It's not. We sit there for four or five, nine days and we watch them take the election from us. We, we cannot. We cannot continue to do that. Anyway, that's, that's all. Thank you so much for everybody.